Bones. We've all got them, but far too often they're taken for granted. We live in a world of big bones and little bones, straight bones and funny bones, but so few take the time to appreciate them all. Despite the fact that most creatures of this world have bones, how many are really proud to show them off? Sure, some individuals like to show off other people's bones, but most seem reluctant to let others gaze upon their own captivating calcium. You know what goes well with bones? Sand. Think about it, when you go to the beach, what do you find strewn all over the place? Bones, of course. And if you crush bones, what do you get? Sand, obviously. Today we're going to bring the bony beauty of sun-soaked sandy shores to those forsaken places where people still cover their miraculous marrow with hideous skins and furs. There are none who indulge in the pure joy of boniness more than the Tomb Kings, for whom the perfect day is flopping around in the sand, merrily bleaching in the sun. Tomb Kings love their bones and aren't afraid to strut their sternum. Given the flagrant disrespect that bones experience on a daily basis, Imagine the chaos that would unfold should Cetra, the biggest boss of bones, find himself awakening from his tomb not in Araby, but from beneath Altdorf itself. Infuriated by the insolence of those who would conceal the beauty of their bones, Cetra immediately realizes he must set skeletons free worldwide, unencumbering them of their fleshy prisons. The message of calcified emancipation resonates with all those skeletons currently going unappreciated in the tombs and boneyards of Reichland, helping us muster the Lumbar Liberation Legion in only a few turns. As we take on this great task, notice how the ground will turn to sand, marking our progress. The spreading of the endless desert is the surest sign that our divine purpose is bringing paradise to the pyramidal. When oppression is the enemy, one is motivated to maintain an aggressive initiative, and so we begin the process of unifying our first province without delay. Where is Emperor Karl Franz, you might ask? I wouldn't worry about it. Because our bony brethren are so enthused about liberating their cousins from their burdens of meat sacks, the military strategy in the early game is going to be drowning the enemy in waves of bones. Along the way, we make an effort to collect canopic jars, which are basically mason jars filled with all the yucky stuff we got rid of so that we could be macho mummies. We like to keep these around to play formaldehyde pong with between sieges, and less importantly, to unlock new items and units. I get the impression that the Empire wasn't planning on Bonanza today, because the garrisons in the first few towns aren't exactly adapting to their new desert climate. I obtain some very twisted enjoyment from watching legions of bony Egyptians watch over the enemy. A very fresh take on the whole biblical parting of the seas. This strategy is very conducive to my playstyle, because instead of spending my time planning and reacting at a tactical level, I can just order the whole army forward and focus on watching the funny little action men fight. Unfortunately, having a short attention span isn't much of a strategy, and before long our chariots take off like coked up toddlers spying the toy aisle from across a department store. This leaves our ivory avalanche without support, which enables the stalwart Imperial infantry to halt our advance. While our infantry are clogged up like a queue at a Cuban gas station, and the chariots are busy chasing horrified Imperials all the way to another planet, our special ability becomes available which spells certain doom for the enemy. The Ushabti are powerful, statuesque war machines specialized in breaking infantry down to their component parts very quickly. We're talking subatomic confetti. Tomb Kings are able to summon a unit of Ushabti once per battle, after enough of our own troops have fallen, which we do as soon as the spell becomes available. The summoned Ushabti swat our enemies away, crumbling the defenders' formations and letting our skeletons flood through leading to a general rout. With the capital province of the Empire secured, all those bones simply buried and generally unappreciated are ready to be given a glamorous overhaul, but the strategy of flooding the enemy with our weak bonelings won't last forever. The Tomb Kings utilize a unique mechanic in which their best units are basically buildings, meaning that we construct the building in our settlement to be able to recruit a single instance of the corresponding unit. It will take time for our masons to carve out the new Ushabti for us, but we mustn't stay idle during this critical period in which so many bones yet yearn to face the sun and the open air. It seems that our empire neighbors have wisely chosen to remain neutral, 
probably trying to avoid an unsolicited serving of cartilage casserole. As it happens, I hate chaos factions far more than any mere humans anyway, especially Nurgle-aligned chaos. North of Altdorf are provinces which are heavily beset by frequent chaos incursions, and in particular is one foul aggressor known as Festus. I can't imagine anything more vile than voluntarily contributing to the spread of Nurgle, which makes liberating Festus' femur an irresistible two birds with one bone situation. In case you were wondering, Nurgle is a pus-filled demon who likes to keep things stinky. He's basically a code word for adults who wear diapers in public for fun. Every single one of his units strives to be the most misshapen, hideous abomination it possibly could be. And honestly, I just have no patience for that level of willful ugliness. Before we can put the screws to Festus the Freak, we'll need to restore order to the province of Middenland, where partying beastmen have raised all the settlements and left nothing but garbage heaps in their wake. To make matters worse, the beastmen have erected a herdstone, which means that none of the settlements can be rebuilt until this glorified pig's pen is destroyed. If we are to expand north, finding and destroying this disruptive chaos monument will be our chief priority. Normally, this kind of obstacle will be aggravating, but Cetra insists on a more positive attitude, consistent with the liberty-oriented movement. Actually, this is a great opportunity to level up our lords and heroes while we wait for better units to become available in our home province. The lords of Bretonia, who rule over a filthy, odorous peasant population to our south, sense that our attention is turning north and seize the opportunity to blindside us. Indentured servants smell so foul that we had to do a double take just to make sure it wasn't more Nurgle worshippers. But no, it was just stinky French Monty Python fans. Fortunately, the Empire had left a formidable fortress at the narrow Helmgart mountain pass for us to occupy, making it much easier to keep our southern flank protected during the coming expedition. Not all of our southern neighbors are eager to be turned into boneless chicken wings, however, and the dwarves and greenskins offer us a non-aggression pact in solidarity, seeing the clothespins on our nose, which is a sure sign of recently having to deal with the Bretonians. By the time our forces cross the River Reich, the capital province is completely converted to sand dunes for our marrow mates to relax and catch some rays. The Beastman encampment is within a single turn's march from our capital city, and so we launch a surprise attack hoping to demolish the herdstone in a ruthless act of unexpected tombonery. The enemy settlement is no match for us, and soon Kemrian pyramids are erected in the chaos wastes of ruined Middenland. But this was only because the Beastman army was away at the time of our sneak attack. The Beastmen remain unaccounted for, and could surprise us in an ambush at any time in this barely subjugated territory, posing a serious hazard. Fortunately for us, Beastmen brains are heaps of cow turds, and they forfeit their ambush advantage to attack the settlement directly. Because our army is composed mostly of units which cost neither up front nor up keep, we can simply allow them to wear themselves out on the chaff until our heroes get the opportunity to unmake the exhausted cowmen. At least, that's the idea. Be warned, what follows is extremely uncomfortable viewing for the scapula sympathetic. It turns out that these actual drooling morons are really good at breaking bones, splitting skulls, mauling marrow, etc. Our basic strategy is to take a position near the tree lines where the enemy ranged attacks will do reduced damage, and we can try to flank our elite infantry and fancy new permanent Ushabti around to wipe them out. However, the cow dudes, who I was literally just making fun of for having poop brains, turn out to be more skilled than I at tactical maneuvering, and quickly outflank our lines while our chariots, who were supposed to keep the beastmen chariots and ranged units in check, turn out to be completely useless and fold like wet cardboard. Beastmen warriors proceed with liberating skeletons from their structural integrity and hack away at our lines ferociously, while our few elite troops remain in reserve. It is clear from the outset that our few units who aren't useless will be decisively important and must be held in reserve until the proper moment presents itself. Brutal combat rages through the woods and into the plains until finally our elite troops are ordered to strike. By this time, however, it has become clear that our bread and butter infantry will not be seeing another battle unless we scoop up their pieces and take them with us. 
Together with the flanking elites, our heroes successfully collapse the enemy's flank fighting in the forest. However, our forces emerge from that small victory into a clearing in which very little of our main battle line remains standing. Between the enemy's flanking skirmishers and the powerful damage of beastly melee infantry in the front lines, our once multitudinous military is nothing but stylishly bleached bones, scattered over the battlefield like some kind of Halloween take on a violent easter egg hunt. Fortunately, smashing skeletons is tiring work, and by the time our still fresh tomb guards and Yushavti hit the center of the battle, the enemy are exhausted and damaged. With both armies basically ground to a disgusting pace, all that remains is for Cetra to duel their hero, Bamu Deathherd, whose foul magic has been causing havoc for our soldiers since the battle began. After an intense and too close for comfort showdown, Bamu is slain and the remaining enemy forces rout. Although the combat statistics are not particularly flattering for our tactical performance, we technically did win the battle. Movements with liberation in the title are historically very okay with massive numbers of casualties on their own side, especially due to corruption or carelessness, so this seems fine. Unfortunately, news of our merciless pummeling quickly reaches the Imperial Lords, who decide to capitalize on our vulnerability and, in a brazen act of bone envy, seize our easternmost town. When it rains, it pours, and in the span of a single turn, we go from having no enemies at all to losing a war on three fronts. Typically, a supreme ruler might be considered a candidate for whose fault is this, but when your entire population are enthralled skeletal slaves who died thousands of years ago, this kind of thing doesn't seem to come up at meetings. Refusing to allow these desperate times to get the better of us and put us on our back foot we spend the last of our gold reserves summoning a special hero who has the capacity to colonize a settlement instantly and to a fully developed state. This gives us an opportunity to bolster our foothold north of the River Reich, undermining any momentum the Beastmen may mistakenly believe that they have acquired and allowing us to turn our attention back south to the opportunistic vultures of Wissenland. Let's quickly recap. We're skeletal badasses from way down south who got mysteriously swapped out with the Emperor of Reichland. You're not here to witness an out-of-season tutorial on pulverizing skeletons into bone meal. Our goal is to turn the whole of the Empire into a desert, and by golly, that's what we're going to do. However, Eben von Liebwitz, commander of Wissenland, wastes no time besieging our capital trapping our especially vulnerable monarch in just about as unfavorable a position as one could imagine, placing our quest in mortal jeopardy. Given how my tactical prowess is that of a fourth grader, after having a brick dropped on his head every morning since birth, it seems very unlikely that a moment of strategic genius is about to save us. However, the auto-resolve calculator apparently has had a stroke and tells us that we will win at the cost of one of our elite infantry if we let the AI hash it out for us. This gambit is perhaps our last chance to save the mission, and fortunately buys us some much needed time to replenish our armies. Now we just have to find a way out of this whole mess about being in a war on three fronts. At this point, it may seem as though the situation is nearing hopelessness. While we were capitalizing on the auto-resolve calculator's tendency to show up to work drunk so that we could defeat the Empire, the Beastmen recaptured Wiseman, where the Herdstone was just a turn ago destroyed. Though the prospects of choosing how to proceed in such a trilemma are intimidating, there's really only one feasible choice. The Bretonians are too far away and too ineffective to warrant our immediate attention, and the Beastmen remain weakened by recent battles and delayed by our defenses in Altdorf and Karelberg. Thus, our only real way forward is to knock Wissendorf out. Now that we have regained our balance, it's time for a little lightning bone creep. Desperate to keep us off balance, Eben von Liebwitz abandons the idea of besieging our capital to assault a different town only one turn after being victimized by the world's only calculator to have ever failed math class. The auto-resolve has sobered up by now and apparently just sucks at its job because it tells me that we're about to get dummied by this ragtag band of flesh bags. Instead of letting the auto-resolve calculator get away with yet another act of public indecency, we're going to resolve this difference of opinions manually. 
All of Eben's combat power was due to his archers and mortar squad, which have some real potential to mess us up, but by now, we have more than a little bit of practice in wrapping our units around their lines to disrupt the ranged units before they have the opportunity to do their dirty work. It doesn't take long for the Empire soldiers to realize that being bound and gagged in a mosh pit is not a fun time, and the few who can wiggle out of our envelopment rout. The battle is easily won, and now Eben is on the run through an endless desert which used to be Imperial Forest, dying to attrition and partisan warfare. An army loyal to Emperor Karl Franz, which was earlier allowed to retreat into Bretonia, has returned with a vengeance, claiming Eilhart while our forces are occupied elsewhere. As the Empire swarms us like gnats, they have no idea the size of Flyswatter which is about to come crashing down on them. Now that Cetra's army is replenished, step one is to retake Grunberg in the south, which currently has a weakened army standing near it, inviting another delectable two bones with one bird situation. Immediately after Cetra claims his victory in the south, our second army, full of only our lowliest skeleton warriors, heads north to reclaim the fourth and final town of our province. However, Otto Atzwinger, the returning Empire General, decides to meet us in the field instead of waiting for the siege. The auto-resolve calculator demonstrates that it is fully committed to the bit, and offers possibly its worst battle forecast yet, reducing its own existence to a parody of itself, while we head off to fight the battle ourselves. For this engagement, we have only basic skeletal swordsmen, while the enemy has brought infantry of various types and plenty of ranged units to bear. Although the situation appears dire, we have a plan. Firstly, we rush to a grove quite near the enemy and take shelter. Within the grove, the enemy's missiles will more often than not hit the trees and therefore be far less effective. The enemy confidently charges our front line, and sure enough, they outperform our weaker infantry. However, the trap is already sprung, and our reserves wrap around their entire line before they have any chance of reacting. So rapid is our encirclement, that we even have time to chase down the rangers in their rear with troops who were just moments ago reserves in our rear. With their forces completely encircled, we use our army ability to summon a squad of Yushabti, which transforms the pocket of Empire soldiers into a meat grinder, quickly breaking their resolve and bringing an end to the battle. Now that we have stabilized our home turf, it's time to take the fight to Wissenland and bring this war back to two fronts. Cetra initiates a siege at Nuln, the capital of Wissenland giving the inhabitants and garrison the choice between gradual starvation or sallying out to meet us in the field. Unsurprisingly, they choose to fight it out with us in the field, no doubt being egged on by the perpetually delusional auto-resolve calculator, henceforth labeled the biggest idiot. The army which sallies out from Nuln is not only far larger than ours, but is equipped with a great many ranged weapons, which will doubtlessly wreak havoc on our gentle bones. There is a very significant possibility that this battle will end in defeat for us unless we receive some luck. Fortunately, that's exactly what happens, because the enemy reinforcements, which contain most of their ranged units, are entering the battlefield near to where our forces are deploying. We race into the woods, arranging our lines to receive the reinforcements as they arrive. What follows is a slaughter which makes the Battle of Tudeberg Forest look like an enjoyable vacation activity. Although the battle results in an unprecedented slaughter of human soldiers, the garrison remains standing within the city. However, having suffered such catastrophic losses, the garrison's defeat is all but guaranteed. Untold numbers of undead and Bretonians, both now at war with us, amass atop the mountains ready to fall upon us like a monsoon. At this rate, we'll never find the spare time to recreationally dissect Festus and turn his jungle of disease into a sandy parking lot for bones. As if inspired by divine providence, Festus suddenly sends us a ridiculous threat, attempting to extort money from us. All those earthly problems that were just moments ago distracting us fade into obscurity as we realize our moment has arrived, the chance to obtain Festus's femur. The undead attack the Helmgard Mountain Pass with overwhelming numbers, but we inflict such terrible casualties on them that they are unable to capitalize on their conquest and leave the fortress in our hands. Although a follow-up seems inevitable, we consider this a sign that the time has been bought for us to pursue Festus with a bandit, while our western foes recover from their defeat. With Nuln suffering even further casualties from siege attrition, the city's defenses can no longer keep us out, and we claim Nuln for ourselves, releasing many skeletons in the process. Unwilling to risk losing the city to a counterattack, 
Cetra stays inside the walls to reconstruct his army, ensuring that no counterattack can be effectively mounted. Now we can begin our eradication of Festus. Everything is now lined up for the long-awaited fighting with Festus. There surely could not possibly be any further distractions. As we had hoped, an army appears near Festus's province Kemperbad for our Lord Cetra to have a climactic final showdown with and wait, are you kidding me? That's not Festus, that's Emperor Karl Franz. Not only does Karl Franz make a distasteful cameo appearance, but Wissenland immediately confederates with him, turning them into one giant pain in my ass faction that now has to be dealt with. This means that Karl Franz literally walked back here for over 30 turns and the game just hands him a whole new faction to spite me. Unfortunately for Karl Franz, his marathon was right into the no man's land of our freshly initiated offensive. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Cetra captures the entire province which was once the troublesome nation of Wissenland, while their new emperor watches helplessly, trapped on the other side of a river. Before we even have to fight him, he comes to terms with his destiny and offers us a peace agreement. Now he's just a homeless guy, slowly dying of sunburn outside the local methabone clinic. Now that we're Dune with Wissenland, we can turn our attention to Festus's festering pustule of an army. Stinkmaster is feeling feisty and begins bringing the pain and plague to us before we have the chance to pivot from wrapping up with the humans. Unfortunately for Festus, the Tomb Kings possessed the greatest quantities of stockpiled pocket sand ever seen and have an ability that blows dirt in your eyes constantly for weeks. Hypocritically, the demons seem to dislike having our bodily dust particles blown in their mouths, and this helps us catch them off balance and regain the initiative. The spreading tendrils of desertification effectively reclaim Festus's forests one settlement at a time, leaving the remaining holdouts isolated and surrounded, while drying out their sweaty jungle hot tubs. While admirable in its ambitions, Festus's strategy has left his capital, the Brass Keep, completely undefended and cut off from the rest of his expanding territories. Unfortunately, this has left Festus in such a sorry state that we couldn't help but auto-resolve the final confrontation when it finally happened. Though one-sided was the battle, it wasn't even worth it for the cinematics. Envious of Carl's cameo appearance, the vampire counts decide to declare war before the video ends and they miss their opportunity. It turns out that they were the enemy we were hoping for all along, as they do a far better job than Festus and the Russian Federation when it comes to conducting military operations. Despite some earlier successes, the vampire counts' very basic skeletons, bare bones, have no chance against our stylish Egyptian threads and crumble away from sheer embarrassment. The Counts have access to some units with better self-esteem, but by this point our armies are outfitted with monstrous constructs who are capable of even more monstrous damage. Although for a time the number of armies they are capable of fielding presents an issue for us, it doesn't take long for their best units to whittle away and we can finally extend the desert from the capital all the way to the mountain ranges that create the southernmost border of the Empire. Hours of my life are spent trampling zombies, impaling vampires, banishing ghosts, and beheading rebel lords. What do you get at the end of all this? A very satisfying pan over of the empire turned into a desert. I hope it was worth the tens of thousands of bones blemished in battle. Perhaps the real monsters are the spectators of war. If you've made it this far, I want to say thanks very kindly for watching my video. Making content for you guys is a very exciting process and I know I'm still at the early stages of figuring out what I'm doing. I deeply want to make content that you genuinely enjoy, and your feedback is really important for helping me get better at making videos that are worth your time. If you have an opinion or feedback regarding what you've seen today, please share it with me in the comments section below. I make sure to read every single comment that gets posted, and I appreciate it very much. Until next time, Praxin is out.